It is late summer in 1802. A flatboat loaded with goods floats slowly down the Ohio River. Stretching more than 1,200 miles, the Ohio is the trade route linking the American East, the French-held port of New Orleans, and the Spanish territory west of the Mississippi. In between is a no-man's land of isolated frontier settlements. The boat enters an especially dangerous stretch, a place along the Kentucky shore just above the Cumberland River. A navigation guidebook of the day warns of treacherous waters filled with unseen shallows and snags. On the Ohio's right bank, you may find persons who are sometimes employed to pilot boats through this serpentine channel. It is better to pay a dollar or two for this purpose than run the risk of grounding. But there is one danger the book fails to mention. On the west bank, a cavern comes into view. It is known as one of the river's natural wonders, called by the French Caverne dans le roc, cave in rock. On this day, however, it has a new name, scrawled on a makeshift sign, Wilson's Liquor Vault and House of Entertainment. Cave and Rock became in many ways like Hole in the Wall was in the period of the later Wild West out in, out in Wyoming, uh, a place where wild and desperate men congregated and a large band of outlaws sort of loosely joined together and there could find sanctuary and uh, always was a great uh, and favored uh, sort of uh, place of recreation. Many boats drop anchor on the cave's small beach. Some seek only a guide or merely to replenish their supplies. But others are drawn by rumors of the cave's more sordid entertainments. A gambling den and brothel. The unwary who visited that place of entertainment often found themselves entertained in ways they hadn't anticipated. The Ohio can be a perilous river. Many boats start down to New Orleans. Some never arrive. Storms are blamed, or hostile Indians. The hired boatmen who disappear with their cargoes are suspected of being thieves. So far inland, few think to attribute the losses to pirates and there are no survivors to argue the point. People wonder why we talk about pirates at Cave and Rock when it's hundreds of miles away from the ocean. But under English law, acts of piracy could be uh, on the open sea or they could be on rivers. And what was happening at the cave certainly fit the definition of piracy. In fact, if you were a victim, it didn't matter if it was pirates of the Caribbean or the pirates at Cave and Rock. Either way, you likely faced a watery grave. Within a year, the American government will negotiate the Louisiana Purchase, obtaining huge tracts of open land from France. And during the half century they are in operation, flatboats will bring an estimated one million travelers down the Ohio River. Not only did the rivers carry merchants with their goods down to New Orleans, but of course, thousands of travelers journeyed on the rivers on their flatboats, heading down to the western settlements, going to find a new life. The very nature of their kind of travel and the transient nature of their life meant that people back east didn't expect to hear from them again for a long time. So their disappearance would simply not be noted. The flatboat, the most popular form of transportation in the decades before the steamboat, proves a perfect target. Most are little more than unwieldy, oversized rafts. Carried by the current, they are designed to go only one way. Once a flatboat is launched, there is no going back. The entire possessions of a family were on that flatboat, and so it was an attractive target for river pirates. 
perhaps if it was a family, they'd seize the women and take them to the cave in rock for their immoral purposes. It was an evil time on this stretch of the river. The pirates develop a range of attack strategies. Sometimes they had their women out acting as victims of a, of a flatboat accident, trying to lure people in to that area to help them, you know, take them down river. The only trouble is as soon as you got close to the cave, uh, that put you at risk of, of being attacked. But not all the attacks are on water. Running through deep woods and isolated wilderness are trails bringing travelers to the banks of the Ohio and the Cumberland Rivers, where ferries are the only route to cross from one state to another. These people, of course, going into a new land, uneasy but still full of optimism, were perfect victims for the river pirates who would come along, for instance, and offer to pilot them on the river, who would uh, come along and offer to guide them and show them uh, where the best lands were to stake out, who would befriend them and, of course, uh, lead them to their dooms. For the pirates, it is an ideal situation. Most of the settlers, coming from the civilized east into the unsettled, isolated, and lawless west, are easy victims, unprepared, and naive. And the river route itself was a wild and lawless territory. American settlement hadn't reached it. And the river itself was not controlled by the Spanish, certainly not by Spanish soldiers or Spanish law. Even the honest settlers in the region do little to raise the alarm. The outlaws and the brigands on the western rivers worked in conjunction with the ferry boat operators, with uh, folks who ran the wayside inns. These individuals provided a market for their stolen property. They were all in the business of making money off western transportation. This permissive atmosphere, where thievery was expected and the occasional rape or murder could be overlooked, is an open invitation to outlaw gangs. But with them will come an evil no one expects, and eventually, no one can ignore. They are known as Big Harp and Little Harp. Born in Tennessee, they are said to be brothers or perhaps cousins. Although they may not share a family bloodline, they do share a kindred love of murder. During 1799, they will descend on western Kentucky, killing every unlucky traveler, settler, or woodsman who crosses their path. One man who counted up the known victims put the total at 39, but he admitted that there were probably more. The classic technique for the harps was to take a body remove the entrails, put stones in the body cavity, and sink it in a river so that not all of those bodies were found. Years later, when a full account of the killings is finally published, the number of dead and the violence of the crimes provokes disbelief. One newspaper defends its story by writing, the depravity and the bloodshed which marked the Harps' existence are circumstances too strongly impressed upon the recollection to be contradicted at this date. It may be regretted that such monsters as the Harps ever should have existed, but it is an uncontrovertible fact. Big Harp, whose real name is Makaija, and his brother Wiley, start their criminal careers as petty rustlers and thieves, preying on their neighbors in isolated settlements in Kentucky and Tennessee. It is the American Revolution that gives them their first taste of killing. We think they may have been born in Scotland and immigrated as children with their parents. Um, it was very pro-monarchy. What we do know is that the Harps got their start fighting the Americans uh, during the Revolutionary War in the 1780s. 
It is during this time that the brothers kidnap two women they refer to collectively as their wives. Then, in 1797, the daughter of a preacher joins them near Knoxville, Tennessee. Little Harp legally marries her and takes her, not on a honeymoon, but on a killing spree. They would be riding down the road and they would come across a traveler or our travelers would catch up to them. If it looked like someone who would have some money or at that point if they needed some decent clothes, uh, and the travelers had some better ones than that what they had on, uh, they would sneak up on them, they would give a, a silent signal to each other and immediately attack, uh, usually giving the, the victims no chance to react. The Harps use their women, who are often pregnant or suckling an infant, to evoke pity. One Kentucky innkeeper witnesses a typically deadly encounter. While breakfast was preparing, the Harps and their women came up. Their appearance denoted poverty, but with little regard to cleanliness. Squalid and miserable, they seemed objects of pity rather than fear, and their ferocious glances were attributed more to hunger than to guilty passion. The next morning, the Harps leave in the company of their new benefactor. The charity of strangers was their undoing because the Harps were interested not only in the goods these people might have, but in the sheer pleasure of killing them. The discovery of the Good Samaritan's body raises a general alarm throughout western Kentucky. A rash of similar crimes is now linked to the Harps. As the number of their murders escalated and as they became more brazen, they became well known. And bands of citizens formed together and hunted them down. The Harps escape, leaving their women to face arrest and trial. Released by a sympathetic jury, the women head straight back to their menfolk. They rendezvous at the one place they know will offer sanctuary, Cave in Rock. There, the Harps take naturally to river piracy, joining the other outlaws in capturing flatboats. But even for their hardened criminal companions, the brothers prove too violent. After one of these raids, they had one survivor from the flatboat. And while the p pirates uh, were holding a party in the cave, the Harps thought it would be fun to take the survivor up to the top of the bluff. They stripped him, tied him on a horse, blindfolded the horse, and ran the horse off the bluff so it would fall into the rocks in front of the cave. Now the pirates inside the cave heard their hoof beats on the rock. They, they heard the, the sky screaming, and they heard the horse. They, they ran out to find out what was going on, only to see the horse and the rider plummet to their death right in front of them. The behavior of the Harps was even beyond the bounds of what was expected from river pirates, and eventually the Harps found it wise to move on. It is July of 1799. Now outcasts even among their own kind, the Harps embark on a final killing frenzy. They head back toward Knoxville, kill several settlers, then a month later change direction and return to Kentucky. There, more killings take place. But the extent of the atrocities and the Harps' involvement are not well publicized. The people from the Knoxville area, they know about the killings in, in the Knoxville area. And in different towns, there's different killings. Sometimes at that point, local people didn't realize that it was the Harps. I've seen a couple of times where newspaper accounts blamed Indians uh, for these massacres. Yet, be based on accounts written later, uh, we know that the Harps were behind it. As the summer wanes in the Kentucky counties near the Ohio River, more than a dozen travelers and homesteaders are killed and mutilated. Robbery is not the motive. Often nothing is taken from the victims but their lives. They killed for the joy of it. 
like a cat toying with its prey. They enjoyed it. They did it quickly, they did it efficiently, and usually they didn't waste powder and lead. So the tomahawk, the knife, was what they used. And with children, of course, and they were great child killers. Um, strangulation, or a handy tree against which a child's head could be bashed, was, uh, was the way they operated. The killings intensify. An entire family is wiped out. An 11-year-old boy is killed. The only thing taken from him is his shoes. In response, the Kentucky governor posts a reward for the Harps' capture. Posses are mounted. The closer pursuit came, the more they escalated their crimes. And the more society tried to capture them, the more they returned to kill and kill and kill. In the midst of this bloodbath, there is one inexplicable lull. The Harps encounter an old man named Tompkins living in an isolated cabin. Somehow they convinced this man that they, the Harps who had killed 37 people in the last nine months, were two Methodist ministers going to their next revival. The man invites the two traveling ministers to a meager dinner. Because Tompkins has to apologize for the, the lack of meat in the stew, they start talking about the hunting in the area. And Tompkins has to admit that he's out of powder. So in an act of generosity, Big Harp takes his powder horn and takes one of uh, Tompkins' cups and fills it up and, and gives him some of, some of his own powder. This single act of mercy comes back to haunt them. A posse riding through western Kentucky recruits Tompkins to identify the fugitives. Within two days, they catch up with the Harps. Some of the posse members fired. Uh, one of the guys who fired uh, needed a gun, so he, he borrowed Tompkins' gun, which was primed with the powder that Big Harp had given him a couple days earlier. Big Harp falls, shot through the spine by a bullet fired with his own powder. Little Harp escapes, and the women surrender. The posse takes its revenge on Big Harp. They took Harp's head, they put it in a saddlebag, and collected the women and headed back to the crossroads about 20 miles away. When they got there, they took his head placed it in a fork of a tree, and for years, if not decades, that skull remained there. And um, throughout the 19th and early 20th century, that crossroads was always known as Harp's Head, Kentucky. With the beheading of Big Harp, settlers in four states breathe a sigh of relief. But the legacy of the river pirates is far from over. The outlaws of Cave and Rock are about to launch a new offensive. And somewhere in the Kentucky wilderness, Little Harp still lurks. It is 1799. Big Harp's head hangs at the crossroads as a warning to the region's outlaws. But the cavern known as Cave and Rock is a bustling center of increasing criminal activity. Overseeing the operation is one of the most cunning of river pirates, a man named Samuel Mason. It is Mason who forms the gang that will use the cave as a gambling den and bordello, and a front for making and passing counterfeit currency. Unlike the Harps, who were, appeared to be mostly killers and psychopaths, uh, Mason was an outlaw. He was in it for the money. so. He wasn't as cruel as the Harps, although many people still ended up dying at his hands. A former officer in the American Army during the Revolution, Mason is an educated man from a respectable Virginia family. His brothers are among the men recruited for the Lewis and Clark expedition, but Mason goes a different way. In the town of Red Banks, Kentucky, he becomes involved in a feud with the local constable. When the man is shot dead, Mason is the prime suspect. He seeks refuge in Cave and Rock, crossing the river into Illinois from Kentucky. 
In Kentucky, you have state government, you have county government, you have sheriffs, judges, militias that can turn into regulating companies that go after outlaws. Yet across the river, you have Illinois, which at this time is still the Northwest Territory, and the nearest county seat's over 120 miles away. There was no law which made it was perfect for outlaws. Mason, one of the few outlaws who can read and write, soon becomes a leader of the local pirates. Over the next five years, he expands their activities to include robbing travelers on the overland trails. Once again, Mason uses a border, the Mississippi River, to his advantage. Mason and the river pirates used that very effectively. Spanish territory was just on the other side of the river. And indeed, there was no law on the river itself. So, so long as Mason carefully avoided committing any crime on Spanish territory, he knew he could simply escape across the river and get away from American authorities. Mason's favorite ploy is to surprise travelers while they are asleep or bathing, robbing them when they are most vulnerable. Yet he often leaves his victims with a horse and even a gun to see them safely out of the wilderness. Mason also takes pains not to antagonize the American government. His gang allows the mail to go through unmolested. Mason himself even strikes up a friendship with a territorial mail carrier, John Swaney. The man later recounts their conversations. He said no mail carrier need fear being molested by him and his men for mail was of no value to them, and he did not desire to kill any man, for money was all he was after. Mason seems to enjoy his notoriety as a gentleman robber. He frequently asks Sweeney for reports on what is being said about him by the public. Mason's refusal to engage in slaughter was his undoing in the sense that there were many witnesses against him and his exploits became common in the newspapers of the day. And like every bank robbery in the West would be blamed on Jesse James. So indeed, in this time, every uh, sunken flatboat on the Mississippi obviously was the work of Mason and the river pirates and every waylaid traveler on the Natchez Trace was to be the work of Mason and his gang of brigands. Mason was a very active criminal but no man could have engaged in the level of criminality that was laid at his door. In 1802 the governor of the Mississippi Territory places a reward on Mason's head worth nearly ten thousand dollars in today's market. Only one other man rates such a princely amount. The outlaw Wiley Little Harp, who is still in hiding after his brother's death three years before. The governor's offer of a reward comes with a warning. These men must be arrested. The crimes of Harp are many and great. Mason is nearly as celebrated. As long as these sons of murder are permitted to rove at large, we may expect daily to hear of outrages upon the lives and property of our fellow citizens. The promise of money mobilizes local bounty hunters and posses. Even the Spanish authorities, who for so long gave Mason refuge, agree to extradite the gang leader when he briefly falls into their hands. Denied his usual asylum, Mason escapes and disappears into the Kentucky backwoods. For a time, Mason eludes the bounty hunters. Then, two men catch up with him. They are members of Mason's own gang, a man named John May and a recent recruit called John Seton. Unlike the authorities, they knew where the hideouts were. They knew who the folks were along the road who had assisted Mason. They knew who the fences were for the goods that Mason had stolen. And so they knew exactly where to go and get him. Mason, misled by the friendly greeting of his former cohorts, lets his guard down. Like Big Harp, 
Mason loses his head. May and Seton carry it back to Natchez to claim the reward. Their arrival creates a stir of excitement, as noted in the local press. The head of Mason was recognized by certain scars and peculiar marks. Some delay, however, occurred in paying over the reward, owing to the slender state of the treasury. The delay proves deadly as curious throngs turn out to view the head of the notorious outlaw and the men who captured him. Seton now is the hero of the hour, but now that he's a hero, folks are starting to look at him and there's just something familiar about him. The man who has come to claim the reward is not John Seton. He is quickly identified as none other than the notorious Little Harp, who disappeared when his brother Big Harp was killed. Little Harp is of course hanged, and then he's decapitated just like his brother had been and his head placed upon the road as a warning to other land pirates and river pirates and outlaws. And indeed, just like his brother's head wound up on that road far to the north, so now his head would stand as a symbol that law was coming to the west. As the population grows and civilization moves west, piracy is forced underground. It is 1815. Civilization has come to the land where the Illinois, Kentucky, and Indiana borders meet, down a highway known as Ford's Ferry Road. A prosperous community now occupies the area just south of the once notorious cave in rock. No longer is the cavern a center of lawlessness. After the death of Samuel Mason and Little Harp, some ten years before, the gangs of roving pirates seem to have dispersed. Or have they? By the death of Mason and some of the other major river pirates in 1804-1805, the outlawry on the frontier there around Cave and Rock continued but it didn't necessarily continue out in the open like it had been. Uh, as local governments organized and you had a court system and set up, the outlaws had to change their tactics. And what they did, they simply became the law. So the heads of these gangs were also the ones who were serving as judge, or serving as sheriff, or constable, or justice of the peace. One such man is James Ford, the local justice of the peace in Livingston County, Kentucky, and the owner of the local ferry service. Ford's Ferry, right on the Ohio River, not far from where we're standing, is a place where travelers were appraised for the sum of their worldly goods, and quite often they'd be set upon after they crossed the river. The proprietor, James Ford, had improved rooms for about 12 miles in both directions on the Illinois and Kentucky side. But Ford does not report any problems with outlaws. Some say because they are members of his own family. And what he did, he simply used his sons, he used his brothers-in-law, and the gang might be based at Ford's Ferry. But as far as James Ford himself, now he's, he lived downriver. He, he was in a different area. He wasn't connected to that. In a time where only travelers and outlaws cross the river on a regular basis, Ford and his gang have a seemingly legitimate reason to do so. Ford shows up in the area uh, as a ferry operator, as a militia captain, as a salt operator, as a tavern keeper, and he's active both in western Kentucky and across the river in Illinois in the area of, of Cave and Rock. Uh, because he was a prominent person and a, a well-to-do businessman, people did not th see him as an outlaw, at least not initially. Ford's men patrol the woods along the ferry road, keeping a watchful eye out for prosperous-looking travelers. Because the Ford's Ferry Gang was a, a modern criminal type of syndicate, 
uh, it had men stationed everywhere. And as a, a prospective target approached, word would be spread up and down the trail, uh, look out for this particular person or look out for this particular wagon train. So they would be ready to attack them. A casual conversation yields everything the outlaws need to know. Where the travelers are going, what prospects they have, how much land they hope to buy. The indigent are sent on their way. The rich and the unlucky are directed to a place on the Illinois side known as Potts Inn. About 10 miles north of Caven Rock of the ferry, uh, is a large hill. That hill is known as Potts Hill. There is a stream comes out of the uh, rock formation there, and uh, people would stop there and water their horses. At an early date, Potts has built an inn at that site for these travelers. Uh, Ford has his uh, tavern and ferry house on, on one side. Squire Potts had his on the Illinois side. In between uh, was a very dangerous no man's land especially if you looked like you were weak, vulnerable, and had a lot of money. The owner was a business associate of James Ford, and some say something more. The man at Potts Inn, Mr. Potts, uh, was a justice of the peace, but he was also a character that is a associated with these assaults on, on travelers coming down the road. Uh, the legend state, people would cross at Ford's Ferry, the ferryman would get word up to Potts that here's someone that need to go. So if Ford didn't do the job on the Kentucky side or his gang, Potts would finish it in Illinois. Potts would welcome them at his inn and invite maybe the, the man of the family or, or one of his victims out with him to go to the spring and uh, get some water. While admiring his all-weather spring, uh, he would knock him over the head and kill him right there. The only thing that remains is to dispose of the body and divide up the traveler's possessions. There is a cut of the take, some say, for Ford, Potts, and whichever gang member made the profitable referral. Although no charges are ever brought against the Potts, their alleged method of murder is whispered about for years. One story, perhaps a legend, concerns the couple's young son, Billy, a member of the Ford's Ferry gang. The Potts end story is this. The innkeeper had been per perpetrating murders at this inn for many years. His son became a, a co-conspirator and a murderer and robber and was doing the same thing. But he got caught on the, on the highway one day by some farmers, saw him doing one of his acts and had to leave quickly. And he left this part of the state. Several years go by. Billy Potts builds a fortune through more legitimate pursuits. One day, he decides to pay a surprise visit to his family. He put on new clothes, had much money, had a fine horse that, and, and a big beard that his own father and mother did not recognize him. When Billy Potts stops to take a drink at the spring, he is given the same welcome as any wealthy traveler. The parents rob the body, take him out to the field and bury him in a shallow grave. The next morning, some of Billy's old friends come looking for him. They said, we just saw him last night and he was coming to pay a visit on you and he dressed up with a large coat and had a big beard and a fine horse and he was gonna show you a lot of money. Have you seen him? And they then realized that it was their son they ran to the grave, dug him up, and tore up his shirt, and there was a birthmark that they recognized as their son. And so they had supposedly murdered their own son. After about 13 years or more of research on this story, we still can't say absolutely 
who Billy was, if he really was, what happened to him, if, he mur if Billy Sr. murdered his son, or what. And he, he, he disappears from the face of history, and we would like to know what happened to Billy. We don't know. One of the things that we do know is that there are a number of graves that we can still identify today in the immediate area of Potsdam. Whether truth or fiction, the ironic death of Billy Potts is one of the last stories told in the saga of the River Pirates. An era will soon come to an end. In the spring of 1811, a strange apparition appears on the Ohio River and slips past the denizens of Cave and Rock. It emits a pillar of smoke and moves at an extraordinary speed. It is the steamboat Orleans, the first steam-propelled boat to make the trip from Pittsburgh to New Orleans. For the moment, though, it is a curiosity. Steamboat technology will not come to the Ohio in full force until after 1816. But when it does, it changes everything. The speed of the steamboats makes them nearly impossible to attack. And they bring far more passengers than any gang of pirates can handle. In addition, the Western territories are becoming civilized. After the Louisiana Purchase, when America could establish civil government uh, on the west side of the river that would go after outlaws. That discouraged the, the whole era of river pirates. Also at this time you had more civilization creeping into the area, more churches, better law enforcement, smaller counties which allowed local law enforcement to better cover the area. The Ford gang begins to disintegrate as the members start fighting among themselves. After a property dispute, Ford files a lawsuit against one of the gang's most senior members. The prospect of testifying makes the entire gang uneasy, and the case is settled out of court with a bullet. Ford's assassin is never found, and the leaderless gang drifts away. By 1818, travelers down the Ohio find Cave in Rock deserted. One observer describes the lonely site in his journal. The wilderness appears to here retain its primeval solitude, its gloomy forests unbroken by the hand of man, penetrated only by the wandering hunter and the roaming savage. Billy Potts will go on to be immortalized in a popular ballad, and a marker still stands at the spring where he is said to have met his fate. The three harp wives who had returned to their menfolk so often are put on trial again and released. However, this time they follow a more respectable path. Two of the wives remarry and cross the river to Illinois. The other settles down to a quiet spinsterhood on the Kentucky side. The heads of Big and Little Harp and that of Samuel Mason, the gentleman robber, turn to dust along the now forgotten woodland paths. The Cave in Rock Bandits will live again in the short story and classic 1941 film, The Devil and Daniel Webster, where the Harps make a brief appearance as members of the Devil's Jury of the Damned. But perhaps their most appropriate legacy is the warning given to disobedient Kentucky children long into the 20th century. The Harps will get you if you don't watch out. Today, a ferry still operates at the end of Ford's Ferry Road, now taking cars instead of victims between Kentucky and Cave and Rock, Illinois. 
The cave itself is thought by some to be haunted. A few brave souls who have spent the night there tell of hearing ghostly voices in the darkness. Are these the restless spirits of the infamous pirates or of their countless unnamed victims? The answer may be reserved for those who make their way to Cave in Rock, not in pursuit of plunder, but in search of history.